My guest today is Lou Elizondo, who is a former senior intelligence official, a disclosure advocate, a national security expert, and perhaps most interestingly, the former director of the Pentagon's UFO slash UAP program, known as ATIP, A-A-T-I-P. So uh, Lou, thank you very much for being here. It's been a bit of a challenge getting some of the key figures in the UAP world uh, to talk. So thank you very much for agreeing to be here. Mick, it's my pleasure, and uh, you give me too much credit for calling me a key figure in the UAP topic. Uh, you know that I think there's a lot of people that probably deserve that credit. Um, you know, I, I'm probably like you. I'm, I'm I'm a spoke in a much greater greater wheel. Well, I think uh, people would disagree with you there, but uh, <laughs> thank you for your humility. Uh, and we've got a lot of material to cover and lots of questions, and I'm going to try to take things kind of roughly chronologically. Uh, but first of all, I wonder if you could just give a one or two sentence description of what you think a UAP is. What's your personal definition of a UAP? Wow. Uh, well, Nick, I think that definition is is constantly evolving, uh, and it evolves with our understanding. Um, you know, there was a time in in our history, and, and I'll try to be brief with this, but it's it's not a it's not a simple question. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a time in our in our in our in, in, in our world where anything that wasn't a bird that we saw in our sky and it wasn't a star uh, was was mysterious, right? Um, these these supposed traveling stars and they turned out to be planets. And then of course, comets uh, later on had this this almost supernatural uh, um, type of 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 identity, if you will, uh, where, where if you saw a comet in the sky, some people thought it was, it was a sign of, of, of things to come. It was foreboding and it would cause sickness and disease. Uh, you know, that was a, a, by definition, a UAP. And then of course we began to understand that. And, and, uh, then you have, um, well, you have in the, in the 1940s, you have these, these cargo religions that were, established in the South Pacific based upon World War II aircraft flying over these remote portions of the of the South Pacific Sea, flying over an island, maybe dropping some provisions. And, uh, you know, that, that was a UAP, right? They, they were they were gods from coming down from heaven, dropping off uh, food for for the people on the islands. Um, and, and that was very much by definition a UAP. And so it, it's hard to say what what is a UAP, because I think as we gain additional understanding uh, into into science and into technology, um, a lot of what was considered UAP before is not a UAP anymore. Anything by definition is is an unidentified aerial phenomenon until it isn't. You know, I think I think the definition of UAP is a moving target, um, and what was once a UAP is now um, something you know that can be explained. Um, okay. For me, a, anything could be a UAP until it's not, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, let's talk a bit about ATIP and kind of go back in time to around, I guess, 2007 when you first uh, joined uh, the program, which at the time was called AWSAP, A A W S A P, I think the Advanced Aerospace Weapons mm-hmm. something 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 <laughs> program. Uh, Advanced Application but, Program. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> What were you actually hired to do when you first, uh, what was your, what you were tasked to do when you first joined uh, either ORSAP or, you know, the, pro- the prototypical ATIP yeah. program back then? I was asked simply to establish a, a comprehensive security and counterintelligence portfolio within the greater construct. Um, my background is as a counterintelligence officer uh, to a lot of people, they look at that and they say, oh, it's disinformation. That's actually not really what counterintelligence does. I, I think that's uh, a, a bit of uh, um, a misunderstanding. Uh, counterintelligence is really understanding what the enemy knows about us, mm. it, it, to put it very simply. Um, I've often told people it's like playing a game of chess. And foreign intelligence is learning what the pieces on the opposite side of the chessboard can do. Counterintelligence is knowing what your opponent knows about your chess pieces and what they can do. Uh, that's a very oversimplified way of looking at it. But my my job was to set up a security program within that construct to A, protect the information we have, and B, to figure out if the enemy is collecting information on us about that, that portfolio. So you're kind of an anti-spying person. You're trying to protect uh, and also do counter-espionage, essentially. 
Yeah, that's exactly that's that's typically most of the job of, of counterintelligence is you use the same techniques as you do in in foreign intelligence collection and human intelligence, but you're doing it for a slightly different purpose. It's it's the other side of the coin, if you will, of, of intelligence operations. So when you when you first joined uh, or separate it, uh, what did you actually understand the program to be about? What, what would you say was the purpose of, of the program back then? Well, initially, I didn't have any understanding. They, they didn't tell me what it was until, <laughs> until mm. after I had a meeting with the director. And then it became very clear to me uh, that we were dealing with, with, with uh, a, a topic involving some, some very advanced technology that we, we really didn't have a, a good understanding. Now, was it clear to you from the start that it was about uh, the study of UAPs? Well, again, let, let me let me say it again. Initially, when I was right. first approached, right. I had no idea what it was about. Um, so maybe I wasn't clear. I apologize. Uh, no, I mean, but after after your conversation with the director, uh, did he tell you we are studying oh, UAPs? Yeah, it was it was very very clear that we were we were studying UAPs. That's correct. We weren't now, studying advanced aircraft. We, we were studying right. something that really fell outside of the normal or traditional understanding of, of aircraft technology. So uh, when you look at like the, the history of, of ATIP and, uh, uh, and, and ORSAT before that, uh, you, you, you see things like there's the solicitation document for the original ORSAT program. And uh, they don't mention UAPs. Uh, they just talk about... Uh, technology over the next uh, 40 years, I think, you know, advanced aerospace technology and speculative things like, you know, warp drives and quantum technology. Why, why wasn't anything mentioned about that type of thing uh, in the initial solicitations and in the initial descriptions, for example, Harry Reid's letter of 2009 uh, doesn't mention UAPs at all, even, even like by, by inference, I think. Was that kind of a, a, a secret part of the program? No, I mean, it, we do, let's look at the dirts. Most of them were unclassified, right? We do scientific and academic solicitations for studies all the time. We don't necessarily tell the side. When we say, we'd like to know the friction coefficient of a reentry vehicle coming in at, let's say, an altitude of 250,000 feet at a velocity of 17,000 miles an hour at an angle of, let's say, 60 degrees. You know, uh, what, what type of material can withstand that? And, and the reason why you might ask that you don't necessarily, in an unclassified realm, tell the scientific communities because we're trying to look at uh, enemy ICBM missiles coming in on reentry, right? So right. You, you're, you don't, when you're putting out an unsolicited, when you're putting out an unclassified um, solicitation for a study, you have to understand that at the unclassified level, anybody can read that, and and so from an opsec or operational security perspective, you have to be very mindful. Um, of, of who's going to see it. And so it's very, very common practice in the U.S. government. We put out these studies all the time, and we don't necessarily tell people why. When you look at the studies holistically and you realize we're talking about warp drive and advanced materials and whatnot, then you begin to understand that, okay, we're talking about really advanced technology. Why would we, would be, why would we be interested in that? Well, clearly it's from a national security and intelligence perspective. And, you know, what... What are we interested in? Well, as it turns out, it, as, as now everybody knows, it was part of the ATIP program and part of the, part mm -hmm. of the study. So when uh, um, Harry Reid, like he, he sent this letter to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Secretary Lin, uh, in 2009, uh, it, was this essentially a kind of a public relations thing then? Or was there some kind of back channel thing where he, he also told Secretary Lin the, the, the reason we are studying these things is that we are studying UAPs. It's not, it's not necessarily just speculative technology. We've seen these things in existence and we want to figure out how to do them. Would he have, so would, I, have told him I, that? I can't speak on behalf of Secretary, I'm sorry, of, uh, of Senator Harry Reid. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you he, he's, he's an incredible human being, but I, I can't answer that question for him. But what I can say is, once again, you, you had mentioned why isn't the term UAP in in that letter well again look at the classification of that letter that letter doesn't isn't classified there's no classification marking on it so yeah. once again you know that's going to go through a whole bunch of folks to coordinate that memo by the time it gets to the deputy secretary 
And so what you don't want to do, again, for operational security reasons, OPSEC and InfoSec and other things, uh, you don't want to give away more than you absolutely have to, with the understanding that there were classified briefings already. So Deputy Secretary Lin already knew what this program was doing. You didn't have to Hmm. specify it and be redundant in an unclassified document if you're trying to protect. I mean, the, the basis of the memo itself was to establish a SAP. So in an unclassified type document, the last thing you want to do is provide something classified that's so sensitive that it should be a SAP and, and yet reveal it in an unclassified document. So it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a leap of faith to, to understand why you're not going to see necessarily right. the term UAP or UFO in there. As we now know that, that the senator has come out and said, and, uh, as, as many others have, and including myself, that the program has always been about the, the, the UAP issue. Yeah. So, but would that uh, have been essentially, I don't know exactly the terminology, a SAP uh, from the beginning, would it have been uh, uh, when you came on, you know, they, they told you this is the public face of the program and then there's the secret face of the program, which is about, about UAPs. I, I can't discuss anything that's classified. So okay. if there were portions of that effort that were classified or, or, or considered SAP, I, I would not be able to have that conversation, unfortunately, uh, in, in, in a manner like this. Right. So, so you, that, that was 2007, 2008, it kind of transitioned into the, uh, the, the ATIP program, which I guess was kind of a, was that a, a refinement of the goals or a broadening of the goals? No, I think it was a refinement of the goals. It was, it was really a, a closing of the aperture where OSAP was a mm-hmm. bit of a, a shotgun approach um, ATIP, ATIP took more of a, of a concentrated, more laser focused approach, really focusing on the nuts and bolts of what is it and how does it work? Okay. So, uh, so you're working at, uh, at ATIP and, uh, at some point you become the director of ATIP. Uh, when, when about did that happen? 2010. 2010. So, uh, you'd been there like two or three years. And so you're the director of ATIP. What's your actual responsibilities and your kind of day-to-day responsibilities running ATIP? Sure. Well, it was the same as, as the director before me. Uh, basically, you're managing a portfolio. And sometimes uh, it's, it can be pretty boring. Sometimes you don't have any really anything to do within that portfolio. Other times, uh, it could be, be pretty, pretty hair-raising and, and, and pretty crazy. Uh, so it really... It depended on the day and the situation, uh, what information was coming in. Okay. Uh, sometimes there was nothing to do, and other times it was it was all hands on deck. And what it was, it was triaging information, trying to determine if 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 what is being encountered is 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 a a, a blue force, something our own technology. Maybe we have some sort of capability that we're, we're, we're using or testing in the area. We didn't do a very good job coordinating, coordinating with other, other elements uh, within the department, or is it a red force? Is it, is there, is there a uh, detected enemy or, or foreign adversarial technology in the area that mm-hmm. we are aware of? Right. Uh, or is it something else uh, with the hope that, you know, it was one of the first two things. Um, it was only after through, through an extensive and exhaustive process of, 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 of deduction, were we able to, in some cases, look at, at some of these and say, okay, these fall really outside the parameter of anything that we have and, and that we're pretty sure that, that our adversaries have. And those were the ones that really now left your head scratching. You have to do a lot of analysis and research on and get a whole bunch of folks involved with and say, okay, what, what are we dealing with? And by the yeah. way, assuming this is what, what, what the cameras are seeing and the radar is seeing and the eyewitness are seeing, what are some of the physics and technologies I could explain this type of performance characteristic, if that, if that makes sense. So you say like when stuff is coming in, uh, was there kind of like a, a pipeline uh, that kind of directed stuff to you? Was there kind of like, uh, you get pilot reports, obviously, of like pilots seeing things in the sky, um, but were there like kind of reporting guidelines that would kind of direct that there were reporting channels there weren't reporting guidelines at the time sadly that's one of the things we really lacked um there were several pipelines that had been established uh, there were we were getting information through various channels uh because those channels knew that we were around the problem was it, it was a bit of a catch-22 
the more you want people to report, then the more they know who you are and what you're doing, right? And then the more upset issues you have. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's it's kind of like going out and saying, look, if you see anything unusual, report it. Well, what does that mean? Unusual? What if I, if I if I see a big wave in the ocean? If I see a, a manatee swimming across the bow of the ship? If I see a Russian submarine or or an interesting looking cloud? What what does that mean? Something interesting, right? So. Uh, that was always a challenge. Say, well, you know, something that might be in the sky, you know, yeah. well, in the sky, what do you mean? Or something might be under the boat, just report. And then <laughs> we'll determine if it's interesting or not. Sounds like you would, you'd have to filter out a lot of stuff if you have kind of very kind of vague criteria <laughs> yeah. for, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and unfortunately it was not as, as organized or structured as, as, as I would like or that we're, right. we're seeing now where there's formal, you know, reporting change and there's policies and there's, there's teams dedicated to triage this information and get it to the right people. So, so say a pilot report comes in and he says, like, I, I saw a cigar shaped object in front of my craft and it uh, followed me for a minute and then vanished. And you got that report. Uh, what would you do with that? Well, first of all, is you want to identify if there's any other cooperating information, right? Is it, is it one pilot or were there several pilots? Was there any radar data collected? And not just from that aircraft, but were there other maybe sensitive platforms in the area that maybe even the pilot didn't even know about, right? That were operating in that same area that we could then pull that data and look at. Uh, was there any pod camera footage, for example, or, or, or gun camera footage available, electro-optical data that then we could you know, compare and contrast that compared to the radar data, compared to the eyewitness reports, and kind of cross-layer all that information to give us a better what we call a COP, common operating picture. Mm. So was this uh, like, did you have like, say, a, 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 a task team, you'd all sit around the table and you'd go, go over it? Or was one person take it away and look at it or multiple No, people? no, we had a task team. No, we did. You're absolutely right. We had a, an inter- a small interagency team of individuals who had very specialized training in certain things. So some might be electro-optical engineers, right? And, and they mm-hmm. understand uh, you know, what a, 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 a weather balloon looks like at 30,000 feet from all different angles, right? You might have a, mm-hmm. uh, a several aerospace engineers um, that can talk about performance characteristics at that altitude, right? Because not all things behave the same way at, at, at altitudes, right? Um, and then you have other individuals. I'll, I'll give you an example, if I may, Mick. Um, yeah. And I've done this a few times. Um, this is a training aid that I that I've, I've had for a very long time, and I don't know if you can see that uh, on camera, but yeah, it's a it. profile of an aircraft, and on the back of it is uh, details of the aircraft from various different perspectives, and you can see here here's some other ones here of different aircraft mm-hmm. uh, in this particular case, front, side, bottom, top, you name it. Here's one of uh, of another aircraft from the bottom, and the bottom line is that. Uh, Individuals in the Department of Defense, many of them are trained to understand what enemy and adversarial and allied aircraft look like. There's profiles and you have to be able to very quickly identify what we call friend or foe. Um, and, And frankly, your survival oftentimes depends upon that. And so we had experts that understood what what enemy aircraft look like their silhouettes if you will uh from various different perspectives under various different weather conditions under all different types of scenarios in order to better um understand what we're dealing with and sometimes we were we were lucky because they would come up and say look actually what you're seeing here is an su-22 for example uh doing a 60 degree maneuver uh probably about a 3g turn at this altitude and this is why you're 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 seeing what you're seeing right in that, that case where, oh, kind of rub the, rub the sweat off your forehead and close the book and say, okay, great. You know, that's, that's the plausible answer that we're, we're dealing with here. Yeah. Um, but in other cases, you know, it, it, it really was, it was, as I've said before, such a, such a effort of, of mental gymnastics to try to come up with uh, what it could have been that um, it was, it was extremely unlikely. Right. Right. So you, would you have like uh, you know an official designation that this has been determined to be unidentified or or determined to be a UAP? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That there was a threshold, and once once you met that threshold, uh, and and that's why the five observables were were so important for us because we we knew what traditional aircraft could do and technology. We knew what um, 
you know, very exotic technology, but still technology that, that we had could do. We were aware of the technology we were developing and what its performance characteristics were. And it's only when you, you really got outside of that paradigm and you had something that was far exceeding those performance characteristics, if you will, well beyond that envelope of not of not of only what we're what we have now, but what we're trying to build in the future. Um, that's when you really were were stuck with 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 the All difficult, right. um, you know, idea that maybe maybe we're dealing with something else. Um, again, trying not to describe an origin. Very roughly, like how how many kind of I guess uh, certified UAPs. Uh would you have come across in your, your time at, at ATIP? Unfortunately, more than, than we were comfortable with. Uh, you yeah. know, we wanted to find a solution for all of them. Unfortunately, I can't give you an exact figure, but enough right. where, where uh, the system became energized. And, and now you're seeing uh, increased reporting coming out. Um, you're having classified briefings being provided to, to uh, elected officials in Congress um, because of that. And again, not, we, not ascribing an origin to this because I know people are always saying, you know, well, Lou, you said for the record, you know, before that it could be U.S., it could be foreign adversarial, but you think it's, you know, something different. Well, yeah, but that's why I don't like to offer my opinion because at the end of the day, we have to let the data speak for itself. We can't ascribe just because I think it might be something. We have to really avoid that temptation and let the data speak for itself. And at mm-hmm. this point, we simply just don't have enough data to yeah. make a, a some sort of, of, of conclusion as, as to what this is. So uh, kind of moving on from, from ATIP, not that, not that we can really move away from it, but like moving on to the, the TTSA period of time, uh, the To The Stars Academy. In 2017, uh, you resigned from, from ATIP and uh, you joined Tom DeLong's To The Stars Academy. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was a New York Times article that came out, Glowing Auras and Black Money, and I believe uh, at least one of the videos, I think it was the gimbal video came out in that article. And around that time, uh, TTSA was releasing that video and the, the FLIR 1 video from the Nimitz at the same time. Was this, was this kind of like uh, all happening together, kind of coordinated? You know, you're talking to Leslie Keane and you're talking to Tom DeLong and it's all kind of one big thing that's happening in this this no, short negative. Time. In fact, I, I never, I never went to go speak to, to anybody in the press. In fact, I, I didn't even want to. I, I, my hope was that when I went with Tom DeLong, it was going to be somewhat subdued. Uh, he asked me, said, "Hey, do you mind? I'm doing a, a kind of an internet type announcement for, for this effort to bring awareness. Do you mind saying a few words?" I'm like, yeah, I saw and I saw Steve Justice were there and and. and we had uh, some other folks. I said, "Yeah, Hal. Said, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy to say a few things." Hal I, had worked with me obviously on on a tip, right. um, but I I did not reach out to the New York Times. Uh, it was not me who discussed with Leslie Kane uh, initially anything about the program. She had her own sources, and somehow she had that video. I did not provide it to her, um, oh. and I, honestly, and I didn't ask where she got it because I, I, I frankly didn't want to know. Um, you know, it, it really wasn't my business and, and I don't want to, you know, overcomplicate things unnecessarily. The bottom line is she asked me to meet with her. I did. I answered her questions. Um, of course, there were questions I couldn't because I, I'm not going to talk about anything that's classified. Um, it was my, my impression she had spoken to other people, quite a few other people before she had spoken to me because she was asking me some very pointed, very relevant questions. In fact, a few I was a bit uncomfortable to answer um, mm-hmm. because it showed that she had a lot more insight into the topic than than I would have expected her to have. So she she had a pretty decent understanding of 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 that effort already, um, and I suspect that there were people that had had spoken to her. So so you were involved in uh, getting the the videos declassified so that TTSA could use them, and at the same having time, having them the key... reviewed. And so okay, so this is let me. That's a great question, Mick. And I think there's a lot of confusion there. People okay. say, well, you got them declassified. Okay. The portions of the videos that people see were never classified. Okay. They were residing on a classified system, okay. but they were never classified. The portions, let me say, say, say it again. The portions that, that have been publicly released were never classified and are not classified. Okay. So my part in that 
And it was after speaking with my office, it was general consensus, but I was a senior guy, so it was my signature, was try to get these videos released, the unclassified portions, so they could be brought out to a wider audience for a more generalized distribution and analysis. Because we did not, after banging our heads against the wall for, for quite a few years on this type of stuff, uh, we realized that within the intelligence community, we weren't, we were, we were, we weren't getting the answers we needed. Nobody could understand, nobody could tell us what was going on. So we said, look, why don't we go ahead, try to get these videos put out to a broader audience, maybe industry partners and whatnot to come out and take a look at these things and see if they can help us with figuring out what the heck these things are. If they, if they have ever seen anything like this before, and, and maybe there's a rational explanation that, that, you know, for the life of us, we just can't figure out. Yeah. Um, and go ahead. So, uh, uh, the, you, you, you filled out this, I got this form here, this 1910 form. 1910. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is this you? Did you fill this form out to get it declassified? Well, I, I can't see too or, well no. what you're holding up. I presume it is the same one. So I'm going to, on good faith, <laughs> say, Let me see if my camera can focus. There it is. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I, I, I presume that's that's the same one. Yeah, it's it says uh, "Go fast, gimbal and flare" at the top of it. Yeah, the title. And yeah, that's MP, that would... MPEG file times three. Yep. All right, uh, and no, it, it says here like uh, on the form. There's a, th a stamp that says uh, "cleared." I'll focus in a sec. There we go. Uh, cleared for open publication. Now, does that mean that? It's basically anyone in the public can can have it, and you can. Get That's correct. It on your That's website. exactly what that means. There's, if you look at the actual DoD directive on Dopser, there are only there is no. Initially, when I asked them, "Hey, I'd like to keep this in in very controlled channels," their response to me was, "You can't do that. Either it's mm -hmm. releasable to everybody, or it's not." So I said, okay. "Well." That's fine. I'm happy if you're okay with it being released to everybody in the general public. That's your call. That's not my call. And when yeah, I say I your there's, call, that's there's, I'm to there's, there was some dispute over that. I think some uh, uh, some spokesperson uh, said that you had to agree to what it says on the form, and on the form uh, it says not for publication, research and analysis only. Uh, is, yeah, is the kind so, of a, so because you don't you don't publish videos, okay? This is not a book. So Dopser, primarily, if you look at the mission of Dopser, even though everything mm -hmm. has to go through the security group review for pre-publication review, you, you, you release videos. You don't publish videos. You publish books, right? You don't publish okay. videos. So that's why you see there, not for publication. This is not a, we're not talking about a book. This is for, for research and analysis. These are videos that we want people to look at so they can tell us what it is is going on here. And the emails exchanges you see between Dobser and myself, they say in there, hey, look, you know, we don't have a problem with these going out at all. Yeah. And in fact, if you look at the Dobser regulations, that category, when it says releasable to everybody, that means releasable to everybody. That's, that's, that is in the definition of the actual Dobser little handbook that is publicly available for anybody to read. And that, by the uh, way, is not my stamp. That's, that's Dobser's stamp. Yeah, yeah. So that means that they have cleared... Uh, yes, sir. All right. So, um, the, the, these, these three, you said these th three segments of these videos were, um, you know, not classified. They were on a classified system. And so you had to get them cleared to get off that classified system. And, you know, you're saying segments, and that kind of implies that there's uh, longer versions of those videos available. Have you seen the longer I, versions? I, I, I can't go into that, unfortunately. Um, mm. uh, you know, if, if, if longer portions exist, uh, uh, that's not for me to, to discuss. All right. So I can, the, I can the, say that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the, the title of the videos uh, that they, they list it here, uh, Go Fast, Gimbal and Fleer. Where did those titles come from? Oh. Couldn't tell you. Uh, I, mean, it's Fleer, not, I, it, I mean, if I could take a guess here, Fleer is forward looking infrared. Right. Uh, uh, but who comes up with these titles? Did, did you, well, usually did you, who whoever the owner of the film is right so so when the film was first taken it's put on let's say let's take the nimitz for example uh that would be that video came to us already with with the 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 name on it and the metadata and everything else that's contained in that video so right the, whoever is the the originator of that um 
you know, would be the one who usually usually assigns the name in the first place. But do you personally know the significance of the three names? Uh, I don't only what I would presume to be, you know, again, Fleer, okay. right? Forward looking at it. I don't think it stands for, you know, I don't know. Uh, since we're Fred talking, and about the, uh, talking about the 1910, let's see if I can just get this up here. Uh, right here, it says uh, UAVs. UAVs, balloons, and other UAS. Now, UAV is unmanned aerial vehicle. UAS would be, an, I think, an unmanned aerial system. And balloons. Why, why did you mention those three things on the form? Because when people are going to look at it, they're going to say, what is this? And unfortunately, that is an unclassified document. Mm. Understand we had been reeling from the WikiLeaks situation. We knew that our systems had been compromised. And we also had a very significant insider threat. So the last thing I was going to do was try to compromise overtly an ongoing sensitive effort to the open public, knowing that our systems could be compromised. That is an unclassified document, and I have to submit it in that unclassified manner. I don't have any other option. If you look okay. at the 1910, the, I, the directions are you have to provide this in an unclassified manner, which is the 1910. You can't classify it. So, so how do you, again, this goes back to the same, same logic with Harry Reid. You can't put an unclassified memo to the deputy secretary of defense with classified information in it. So how do you do that? Well, you, you can't. So what you do to make sure that you are okay is you make sure that the OCA, the original classification authority, is the one who's ultimately going to approve the release of that, who does know the significance of those videos, right? And that's why you see in there where it said, look, you know, you need to check with the original classification authority, which was, well, I'm not gonna say it was, but it went to that office and they turned around and said, yes, these are truly unclassified. And in fact, we took it a step further. Um, my office, because of, of the, the uniqueness of these videos, we actually went to two of the most senior foreign disclosure officers, FDOs, in the entire Department of Defense to have them actually review the videos and say, okay, even though now Dobster has said they are unclassified and the OCA has agreed that they are unclassified and we have the release, we want to do one extra level of due diligence just to make sure, is there any possibility that releasing these videos, if they come out to the public domain, can cause some sort of compromise of national security information if it gets into foreign adversarial hands? And that's why we went that extra step and we went why 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 balloons? Why did you use balloons as a uh, generic descriptor? Well, let's go back to the beginning of our conversation, uh, which I, I I think you agreed with me, maybe maybe not. That that anything is a UAS until it's not right. Anything mm. is a, a UAP until it's not unmanned aerial system. Well, what does that mean? Well, if it's not a human being inside it, then it is technically a UAS. It is an unmanned, it's aerial, and it's just some sort of system. Okay. Same thing with UAP. So, you know, it's 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 not disingenuous to say that because we quite frankly don't know what we're dealing with. Now, clearly in the videos, we're probably looking at something that is not that. Um, after yeah. the extensive analysis that was done, and I know some people argue about that, and that's fine. I, I respect Well, I'm, I'm just about to argue about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Because uh, okay. I'm one of the people who's done a, a lot of analysis, uh, you know, independently on on these three videos, and I like to talk about them and kind of get your take. I don't, I don't Have you ever seen any of the videos that I put out analyzing these videos? I, I, I'm aware of your work, Mr. West. Yes. Okay, okay. All right, so uh, let's start with uh, the Fleur video, the Nimitz video. And uh, my hypothesis there is that it's some kind of distant flying uh, plane or drone or something like that, and that uh, it doesn't make any sudden movements. Now, a lot of people, they look at this video, it's kind of this, this blurry video taken by Chad Underwood. It's very low resolution. And you see the thing kind of jumping around. Uh, but I think it always coincides with a change in the camera system. And I did a detailed breakdown where I went through the video one step at a time, saw when the camera had changed or there was some kind of camera rotation or uh, a lens change or change from um, you know, IR to, uh, to uh, uh, TV mode. Uh, and it was always correlated with some kind of movement of the object and a loss of lock and then a regaining of lock until the final thing where there was one big camera movement and there was a loss of lock and it just didn't regain the lock 
and then the camera changed from tracking mode to uh i believe the ground tracking mode and then the, the object itself went off to the side um are you aware of like uh well, well first of all like what do you think of that analysis if you if you're familiar with it at all and do you think well that I, it's I, been I think proven taking, the other way i think well i let me answer great questions and you have a couple questions there so i want to make sure i'm thorough and, and answer them uh, appropriately uh do i think your analysis is valuable absolutely it, it's always valuable did we conduct our own analysis Absolutely, very comprehensive analysis. Um, did we come up with the same conclusion you did? We did not. Um, and my question to you would be is, you're looking at the video. Um, are you certain that there's not other video or perhaps that there's also uh, perhaps radar data that correlates well, uh... with what the pilot testimony? That would be great, but unfortunately, you know, I've only got the video to go by. But my point there Correct. isn't really that there may be other data, is that people are taking the video itself and they're saying this video itself shows these things. Like Chad Underwood says, this video shows the object flying off very rapidly at the side. Within the, the unidentified TV program on the History Channel, it was claimed that this video itself was evidence of the object flying off. And I would put well, it that it, the, the video itself could be interpreted as just a regular object, not making any sudden moves. I, I think your interpretation is, is I, I think you're certainly entitled to, to your own opinions and your own interpretation. Um, I will tell you with my experience, uh, take it for what it's worth. Um, that was not the interpretation. And mm -hmm. we look at things in the government, we tend to look at things holistically. Um, we try to avoid single source reporting uh, from an intelligence perspective. It's kind of a no-no for us, right? Just like in reporter, in the world of uh, reporting, you never look at a single source. Um, and so that's why it's important to look at these videos in the greater context of, of um, in the manner in which they were taken and the circumstances. So, you know, anybody can look at a video and we see all the time videos that, that show things that um, appear to be marvelous and then turn out to be not so much, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then in hindsight, uh, there's also other examples where you look at something and something seems to be fairly rudimentary. And all of a sudden you realize after some careful analysis that it's actually extraordinary. Um, and I would be, I, my caution to everybody, anybody out there is when you're looking at a video, understand that a video itself is only gonna tell you so much. Uh, and that's why you need additional information to look at that can either corroborate or refute that information. And based upon my experience in the ATIP program, um, there is certainly uh, additional information that made it um, very, very compelling. And again, people are going to say, okay. well, what is it, Lou? Why don't you tell us? I mean, we want to know. Well, I, 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 I can't. But, but that information is starting to come out. And when you look at that data that's compared to not only what you see on the GAN camera footage, what you hear with the eyewitness testimony, what you see on the, uh, the Hawkeye uh, radar information, which is backed up by the SPY-1 radar data from the Princeton, and possibly, and I'm not going to say yes or no, other sensors that were in the area at the time. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a much more complete picture of what's actually going on it would be great uh, if I could get that picture, of course, but <laughs> unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm just like, you know, a member of the public. All I have access to is this one video, but let's move on to the and, next. And, uh, and I respect that tremendously. And this is why, Mr. West, I wanted to have this conversation with you, because I think I, I think it's unfair for for I think it's unfair for me to criticize you. And I think it's unfair. No, I'd, for I'd be happy for you to me. criticize me. No, it's not. It's it's not a personal thing. I th I think everybody is entitled. No, to I didn't mean opinion. that. But I mean, this is criticize specific things that I've said is fine. Like if if I've said something that uh, you think is wrong, I'd be happy to be. be pretty sure. Well, there's a difference between being critical analysis and criticizing, and and okay. I don't think right. I don't think we I think well, let's, critical let's analysis. To the okay, uh, the gimbal video is a bit more self-contained. Uh, I think because there isn't that much kind of uh, other stuff associated with it, at least in public. Uh, the gimbal video shows what looks like a little flying saucer uh, type thing. And it's got this, this, this 
aura around it. And that was kind of reflected in the, the title of the New York Times article, Glowing Auras and Black Money. Uh, but the aura was later discovered to be just kind of a standard artifact of the infrared um, the infrared camera system is this thing called an unsharp mask, which uh, creates uh, contrast in the boundaries between light and dark. Uh, and yet this was something that was, it was promoted on the PTSA site that there was an aura on the New York Times thing. It was on unidentified. Why wasn't this discovered? If it, it's such a fairly simple thing that it's, uh, you know, it's just an artifact of the camera. Even Jeremy Corbell now admits that it's just an artifact of the camera. Why wasn't this discovered right from the start? Well, because I, I don't subscribe to that. I think you can you can look at something and say, oh, it's it's a artifact of the of the infrared and heat signature. But are you sure there was even a heat signature creating that? that I mean, I don't know the physics what creates that and whether it is something naturally occurring or not. Um, but there are other explanations. What you see on a camera, you can say, it well. This explains that. Well, but there's other things that do too. And you're assuming that it had it had a heat signature, right? Um, because we're what, looking at- What do you mean by a heat signature though? I think there's a lot of confusion as to what, what a heat signature means. So from your- Well, infrared. Kind of so infrared in, in a technical perspective, you're looking at, at, at light wave energy below mm. the visible spectrum of the red uh, frequency, right? So yeah, infrared, yeah. which means below red, and right. you're usually typically dealing with that type of signature can be can be attributed to heat, right? Infrared. Mm -hmm. You use like we use infrared cameras. Um, so if, you, if you're getting a picture of something, aren't you getting a heat signature? It's an infrared camera. You can only see it if it has a heat signature. Well, that's not true. You you what you see is contrasting in temperatures. It's not necessarily heat. You can also see with infrared cameras cold spots, which is the absence of heat. So right. my, my point being is that. You know, we have to be very careful when we're, we're looking at something. If we see something that, that fits a, a conventional model, well, okay, great. But I, I guess my, my word of advice to anybody, and this is including folks in the government as well, always look at the second and third order layers of data. It's important not to, and this is what we found in ATIP. In some cases, it would help us find conventional explanations. In other cases, it didn't. Um, you know, if you see something, an accident on the street, for example, you see two cars collide and one naturally assumes one car hit the other. Well, okay, it may appear that way, but but you have to start, that's where the investigation really is important, that investigative process to make sure you're, you're not assuming or presuming something simply based upon looking at something in a video. Sure, sure. But, um... Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. It looks like it is a, a glare of a heat signature, which would be like something like a jet. Like my my, my broader hypothesis with this is that you know if you have a, a heat source, which I'm simulating here with a light source, and you shine it at a camera, then you get this glare around it, which is much bigger than the heat source. And we see this in videos of of jets. Uh, the yeah, lens the lens. heat source yeah. covers the jet itself. It actually something that does lens, actually lens happen. It does happen. You're right. That's called lens flare. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's not really lens flare. Lens flare is the re reflection. No, this is lens flare over here, uh, right. the reflection within the lens. This is glare. Uh, this, this yeah, but, some, the, you, but your lens flare is creating a, a halo effect, if you will, from the object. And so a lot right. of people have it's, said, well, this is, you know, this is an artifact of, of the camera, or this is lens flare, or this is a, you know, an, an uneven distribution of, of light energy, as you say, from, from, from a heat source creating this, mm -hmm. this, this, you know, fuzziness, if you will, or this, this, uh, this aura. Um, but, you know, again, you have to understand temperature differences, you have to understand sure, sure. differences, you have to all those things to determine. And I have, or I have done a lot of possible. research on, on this. Uh, but, you know, what, one thing that you know, really, I think, sways the argument here is that in the gimbal video, you've got this, this saucer shaped thing in the middle, which you say might not be a, a, a glare, but I, I think it is a glare. And at some point you see it rotate, which is very strange. And it's the thing that gets everybody excited. But if you look at the high, high quality versions of the video that were finally released by the DOD, you see that um, the horizon stays solid. It stays at a certain angle, um, I think it'd be this angle. And then you see this thing in the middle here and you see it, the shape of this thing rotate, but you also see light patterns in the sky rotate 
coincidentally with uh, this thing here at the same time, uh, which seems to suggest to me that that it is in fact, the rotation isn't a rotation of the object itself. It's a rotation of the, something in the camera system, which is causing these, these reflective internal patterns to rotate and this glare to rotate. Is that something so that was even you, considered? Yes, sure it was. But then when you look at the horizon, the horizon doesn't change. The right, but that's, that's the whole changing. point though. I mean, no, the, the, it wouldn't change because uh, uh, there's this thing in the cameras called a derotation mechanism. Uh, right. that corrects for um, the, the gross gimbal movements of the camera. You know, you know the, the thing, it's a 500 pound, six foot long sure. pod, and it, it's got this got very heavy like front thing at the end. And when, it, when that thing does a big rotation, that thing itself weighs like you know, 80 pounds or something, it, it's, got, it's got these big gears grinding and it kind of jutters around. So they try to minimize the use of that and they use the internal uh, steered mirrors to actually track things most of the time. But when it transitions over zero degrees, it has to rotate. And we see that in the videos. You actually see it in the FLIR 1 video, the Nimitz video. And we see it in the gimbal video that there is a rotation. Uh, and it seems like the entire light field rotates and this little object rotates, which really suggests but to me that it's- The uh, only way you're going to get a horizon to stay straight. Let's go back to then some, some study here. Let me grab, the, here, I'll grab this for a second. Forgive me. This nail represents an object flying, and this is a horizon line. The only way I'm going to be able to demonstrate this rotating and this staying straight is if I have two different cameras, one focused on this and one focused on this. And the one that's focusing on this doesn't change while the one focusing on this does change. In this particular case, you have one camera focusing on both the horizon and the object itself. And the orientation of the horizon does not change consistent with the orientation of the object inside. Yeah, Furthermore, yeah. you have... You have, you have the eyewitness testimony of the individuals who got pretty up close and personal to this thing as it was rotating. And again, well, you're seeing I, a- We have- Go ahead. Do we, do we actually have eyewitness testimony? I think we have, we have the, t the audio on the tape itself, but- Yeah, we have eyewitness know, testimony. <laughs> you might not have it, but <laughs> it's there. You have it? You have, so you, you say that not, an eyewitness I'm a, well, saw- I'm a, I'm a, I'm a public, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a civilian right now. I'm no longer a public servant, so right. I don't have it now. But well, I'm, I'm very well aware of that case. Yeah, you know, I think uh, respectfully, uh, I don't think you understand the the argument I'm making with the rotating glare and the, the horizon okay. and the, the Maybe horizon not. Please, staying. Please, please explain. Uh, and we don't really, we, I think we really have time to get into it, but, but basically uh, the camera system is mounted on two axes uh, externally, the, the big, you know, external 600 pound thing. Right. Uh, and because because of that, you can't actually track something from left to right ahead of the, the forward position just with that gimbal system. Uh, so when it, when it transitions zero degrees, and this is something that's mentioned in the pattern, it has to do a rotation, uh, a physical rotation of the whole system. Now this would make the image rotate. Uh, so to counter that, it has a, an internal system called a derotation system, which rotates the image back so that the horizon doesn't move. So you've got this, this camera going like this and then it does this little flip and then it carries on or it does a couple of them. Uh, corrections kind of try to minimize image disruption. And then, uh, uh, then, the, it, then it's derotated, this image is derotated. So from the pilot's perspective, you don't see anything. It just looks like you're tracking from left to right across zero degrees, everything is fine. But because there's been a rotation of the camera and because the glare is relative to the orientation of the camera, this makes the glare rotate, but the horizon not rotate. I'm, I'm not sure I'm tracking. I, I, I apologize. Yeah. I, I think what you're saying is that the the software is correcting, is somehow keeping the horizon line straight, uh, but because the physical attribute of the camera having to rotate, the object is rotating. But I, I'm not familiar with the system, not flipping the, the if you're going to rotate the object while not rotating the horizon. Yeah, it's um, not rotating I, the object though. It's rotating a glare, like a, a sh the shape of the glare. Uh, like, like oh, this, I see this. what you're saying. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. You're saying the, okay, so you're presuming or assuming that the object inside is is not even perhaps an object. You're just you're just referring to the to if it was a glare. And yeah, not well, I mean, I think it's, it's I think it's an object. Like you know, this flashlight is an object, right. but when we turn it to the camera, all we see is the glare. And then if I was to rotate this camera, uh, you would see the glare rotate, even though- in Yeah, the, so, in, so in the what, your, what your hypothesis is, correct me if I'm wrong, but let me, I just wanna make sure I get this correct. Your hypothesis is that the object 
that that is that is creating that glare you're not right. actually seeing in the camera you're only Correct. seeing the glare is that what yeah, you're, so, you're yeah so yeah so i'm thinking you're looking basically at the tailpipe of an f-a-18 that's like you know yeah. 10 miles away no I, I i understand what you're saying i i will have to respectfully dis disagree okay. um and, and again uh please don't i'm not um I'm, I'm certainly not trying to be argumentative here no, no, no. but the data that that we had did not did not demonstrate that you were just looking at at a, at a glare uh um, all right well we've already got eight minutes reasons. left so i want to just really quickly <laughs> okay. get on to uh sure. the go fast video Sorry. uh okay uh now the go fast video it was said originally that it was a low and fast object but if you do the math on the the range and the angles that are shown on screen you can see that it's actually a high and slow object are you familiar with this discrepancy well I, i'm familiar with the alleged discrepancy but that is not the position of those that were inside the government um so mm -hmm. you know i i i i'm always i think an uh, alternative hypothesis is always uh, interesting and always worth having a discussion about. It's pretty straightforward uh, math, a, though. I mean, would that imply that the 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 readings that are displayed on screen are actually wrong, the angle and the range? Well, that's a question we'd have to go back with, isn't it? That's a question that we'd have mm. to go back and and figure out why there's a discrepancy. Um, right. I can tell you that that several individuals that were very qualified, uh, particularly in that particular collection platform. Uh, were able to discern that this was an object that was indeed moving at a, a fairly fast speed. I can't tell you what that speed is, uh, but I but I know what that's what what was indicated to me after quite a bit of analysis. And by the way, okay. let me make this clear: it wasn't world according to Luke, or it wasn't even world according to ATIP. We we had truly some of the finest engineers and scientists and and other organizations within the intelligence community providing that data to us because we're not engineers, right? So we, we really needed those experts to tell us what it is we were seeing. And then um, the discussion with the pilots uh, were also very interesting because according to them and according to, again, radar data, not just what you see in the camera, that the performance characteristics of, of this object, the particular way, I presume you're talking about, again, go fast. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That that there were some uh, very compelling um, signatures associated with that with that video. All right. So you, you have access, or you've had access uh, to additional. I do not data. have access now. And and let me right. again, let me make this clear because I <laughs> I have a non disclosure agreement with the government, and I know it drives people nuts. Um, but uh, I do not have access to that data now or anymore. But fortunately, there are people in the government that do. And they have a lot more information than just that. Um, so again, I guess my word of advice to anybody, not, not just you, but anybody, even, even to myself and everybody, we try our best to avoid single source reporting. It's, it's very important to, when you are looking at something, have all the available data that you can have in order to cross-reference um, what you're seeing because seeing something is only part of the picture. And again, remember what you're seeing may only be a portion of, of, of an event. It may not be the entire event. All right. Uh, I know we're not going to get to all my questions that I have here, but I, okay. I want to just do one more thing that I want to discuss briefly with you. The, uh, there's, there was a chase, there was a case uh, publicized by Leslie Keene in the Huffington Post about the Chilean Navy, uh, the Chilean Navy, they saw a object ahead of them and it looked like it was just some kind of black blob on the IR and they couldn't really make it out in the TV mode. It started spewing out some stuff out of the back and it was investigated as a UFO by uh, SAFA, I think C-E-F-F-A. Oh, yes, if I looked like a contrail, like a black contrail yes. coming out at the end yes. of it. Yeah. I think I'm familiar uh, with it. Yeah, uh, and that was something they investigated for two years. And, and Leslie Keene, if you look at her original article, she said like it was highly trained Navy pilots who were you know, trained to observe these things. And then they had this whole team of people, they all sat around the table and they sent out uh, to other places to get, get sources. And they looked at the radar data uh, in the I, area. I can tell you uh, from my perspective, and I also want to say this, I'm unqualified to, to make this assessment. You know, to me, it looks, when you look at the video, it looks like a plane looks like, like mm -hmm. an aircraft traveling at a relative, you know, cruising altitude, cruising speed. But I wasn't there for that. And I, I will tell you now, I do not, nor did I have access to any of the data that the, that, uh, the Chilean military had right. access to. So I, I, I guess cannot... Go ahead. My point here is that, you know, we've got this, this group of highly trained people, like the Chilean, I mean, I'll 
probably not as good as the the US the US Navy, but you know they're still they're, they're, no, still they're good. good people. They're, hey, listen, yeah, yeah. you know what? To to, to fly a multi million dollar weapon system, sure. you, there's no such thing sure. as not being good. There may be people that are better, but yeah. they're all good. Yeah, I think it's a helicopter pilot. Uh, but my point is, they couldn't figure out what it was after two years, and then they released the video. And uh, within a week, people on the internet tracked down exactly what plane it was. It was, as you said, it was a plane. Uh, and those things that looked like contrails were actually contrails. They were a type of contrail right. called aerodynamic I'm contrail. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if, if that big team of people can spend two years looking at something and get it wrong, what's to say that you haven't done that? Yeah, well, I can't speak for the Chile, again, back, back to what I said, I can't speak for, for the Chilean armed forces. I, I don't know when they had uh, who they had looking at it i can only speak mm -hmm. from my perspective with the united states government um you know you're asking me to to hypothesize the the capabilities of of aerospace engineers if they were used at all uh, in chile right um, but a bunch of nerds know, on speculate. the internet figured it out in in less than a week i think it was about three days before the and plane I think itself was i ID. think that's testimony to to the wonderful world of of social media and the world wide web yeah. This is exactly why the, the UAP issue on, on social media and as we're seeing now on Twitter is, is so good because you're, you're, you're getting a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different minds looking at the, looking at the same object. But I, I can tell you what, you what I saw in that Chilean video um, for me is, is not what compelled me to continue to pursue this in the government. Um, what okay. I was privy to was far more compelling than um, than what I saw in that Chilean video. And by the way, no disrespect to, to anybody who's been part of that Chilean video analysis, because again, I, I don't know them personally. And it's mm -hmm. not a personal thing for me. You, my honest opinion, it looks like a, like a typical standard aircraft, probably a commercial plane, uh, you know, maybe with a slight increase in altitude and you're looking at its contrails, probably from twin engine, I suspect, I don't know for sure. Uh, but it looked like that to me. An interesting thing about that case is if you look at it, it, it is actually, uh, you, you can't see the plane in the infrared. All you can see is the glare of the engines, which is right. a lot bigger than the plane, which is very similar to the gimbal, gimbal video. But I guess my point here is, uh, I think this is why I don't entirely believe, when I say I don't believe you, I believe that you know, what you're saying is true, but I think there is a possibility still that you may be mistaken and your group may be mistaken. Even though they're highly talented people and they've got all this, this extra information, I still feel that because Chilean government messed up. Well, perhaps... I'll, I'll tell you one thing for sure. Governments mess up all the time, Mr. West, and, and we're fooling ourselves if they don't. I mean, we've, well, we're not going to go into anything political here, but we've started wars off of mistakes. Okay, so if anybody thinks that their government is yeah. perfect, you know, then I've got a bridge to sell you. But the government is trying. And I, I think that when you apply, you know, the talent and resources that we had available, um, it paints a very compelling picture. Do we have the answers? No, that's why they're called UAPs. Because at the end of the day, we don't know what we're dealing with. And maybe it is, uh, in some cases, um, you know, something that can be conventionally explained. In these three cases, I, I beg to differ. But that's okay because that's that's the beauty about about this conversation. Yeah, I think yeah. Ultimately, you know, the truth the truth has nothing to fear. The truth always comes out, and if it turns out to be, you know, uh, a kid with a remote controlled airplane with some tin foil wrapped around it to, you know, spoof a camera, then so be it. Then we have an yeah. answer, right? Um, and I, I I think that's okay. Yeah, we're all searching for. For answers here and this is yeah and, and look as far as belief I, I look there's there's four categories of people and i know we're going over my time but let me let me if i may just digress here sure there are four categories of people the first category are those no matter what happens they're always going to be believers the second category are those people that believe now but they can probably be convinced otherwise if there's compelling information the third category of people are those people who don't believe but can probably convince Otherwise, if there's compelling information. And the fourth category is those people who are never going to believe no matter what happens. Okay. Sure. My job is not to, to, to convince anybody of anything. I, I'm not trying to have any, I don't, I don't give a damn if people believe me or not. My focus has been getting the government engaged to figure this out, which is what it should be doing. Whether it's a balloon, whether it's little green men from Mars, whether it's a Russian uh, new surveillance platform or anything else. The government has a job to figure it out and not ignore it, period, full stop. And so that is what compels me to continue doing what I'm doing and have this conversation. 
openly with anybody who wants to have it. I don't get paid a penny for this. I don't have my YouTube channel. I'm not getting advertisements. You know, I'm, I'm doing this because I, I believe in what I'm doing. And I'm not going to focus on the first category, those people who, who are, are true believers and those people who, and the second, the fourth category, people who no matter what will never believe. I'm not going to convince them either way. It's a waste of time. And so for, you know, I, I don't come out here for people to say, oh, you know, I want you to believe in me or believe what I'm saying. That's irrelevant. What I'm trying to say is get the data, get the government to do what it needs to do, collect yeah. more data so we can figure this out. That's all this is about for me, because I've seen the compelling data back when I was in the Pentagon. And it was very compelling. And I can tell you that the senators and some of the people in our government have received now similar briefings with even more relevant data. And they are all unanimously coming out saying the same thing. Anybody who has received that classified briefing has come out and said, we need to take this seriously. And, and that's, that's my only, that's really my only, my only perspective in this is that I think, you know, I think we can both agree that we need more data. Yeah. I'd love to have more data. And, and we need more transparency into this. Yeah. I would certainly put myself in the category of people who would be convinced uh, by compelling data. I would, I would love to see this, this data that you are, unfortunately are unable to share with me. Uh, but uh, yeah, for now, I, well, I, I, I think do that have data to... is, is starting to come, to come out. Yeah. I, do, I do think that, that would be great. Well, I guess I can wait. And it's coming out in a legal way, right? Where nobody gets in trouble. So, yeah. Well, uh, I, I have a huge list of questions yet to be answered. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have time for it, but, Mick, I'm happy to do this again sometime. Great, that would Absolutely. be great. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, you have an open invitation. Stuff. And a lot of people on Twitter asked me to ask you questions, and uh, we don't really have time. So I know you have a hard stop on the hour, and you've gone a few minutes over, which is is great. So I just want to thank you very much uh, for this time. It's been it. a very interesting conversation. Watch more podcast clips now on our YouTube channel. Go to Livewire Podcast Clips and watch more great podcast videos just like this one.